Amen. All right. The title of the sermon this evening is Jesus, the deity of Christ, actually, the deity of Christ for beginners. The deity of Christ for beginners. Now, I've preached a few sermons, of course, when it comes to the deity of Christ in the aspect of Lord and Christ. And I've preached also some sermons about the deity of Christ when it relates to the coming of Jesus Christ. And, and I preached a whole you know, series on the Godhead in general. And, it, and, and all of these sermons really have something in common. They dealt more with the complexity, the, the, more of the aspect that is maybe hard to understand. But I want to spend one sermon you know, for a couple of different reasons. I want to spend one sermon on just basic, basic thoughts. I'm going to give you seven basic ways to prove that Jesus is God. And let me begin by saying this. The doctrine of the deity of Christ or the deity of Jesus. Go sit down, Jeremiah. Go sit down right now. Go sit down right now. Gosh, that kid. The deity of Jesus, the deity of Jesus is a very simple doctrine. It's not difficult. It's a very easy doctrine. And it's, let me say this too. It's very, very clear in the Bible. It is extremely clear in the Bible. It's just as clear and as obvious as, let's say, salvation by grace through faith. It's just as clear and obvious as the fact that the rapture comes after the tribulation. There are many, many things that are, you know, and, and it's funny that people be screwed up on these things when the Bible just plainly says so. And the reason why those doctrines are very, very, you know, simple, and I refer to them as being simple, is because these are things that the Bible just plainly states. It's just you can find a verse that just plainly states these things. And, you know, um, there are a lot of simple doctrines in the Bible, but I would say probably at least top three would be the deity of Christ. It's a very obvious you know, easy to understand and simple doctrine. And I want this to be a very simple sermon just proving that Jesus is God. And just kind of, you know, uh, help you to add to your arsenal of just having some ammo when you're out soul winning. Maybe when you're speaking to someone at, at your workplace or whatever it may be. Just to show them that there is no question that Jesus is God. And like I said, I'm going to give you seven ways to prove that Jesus is not a man, just a man but rather that Jesus was God in the flesh. He was not just a man. He was God in the flesh. Number one is the fact that Jesus is called God. There are, there are plenty of verses that actually just say Jesus is God. Now, what type of verse, if we wanted to, to prove that Jesus is God, what would you be looking for in the Bible? What would be the number one thing that you would want to find? A verse that just tells you plainly that Jesus is God. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. It says this, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then it says this, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now there is no argument about whether or not this is speaking about Jesus Christ. Everyone agrees with that. There is no form of theology, no denomination. There's no one that would say, hey, this is not speaking about Jesus. And I want you to notice what it says. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, real simple question. It's, it's so simple. This is how simple the doctrine is. Who was manifest in the flesh? God. Isn't that simple? So we just have a plain verse. Real easy to understand, plain verse that just tells us God was manifest in the flesh. Now, if we dig deeper into this verse, you can further prove that that just makes perfect sense in just this verse alone. Notice that it says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, if Jesus Christ was just a normal man, what would there be a mystery about him? What mystery would there be about the fact of making some statement of just God was manifest in the flesh? But I'll tell you what is very mysterious and what is very difficult and hard to understand is the fact that the one and only true God came down and was born in the flesh. Now, that's understanding that. Now, knowing that, reading the Bible and knowing that that is a fact is something totally different. But wrapping your mind around the mechanics and how the one true God actually came down to this earth and was born on this earth and was clothed in flesh, that is a mystery. So you can see very clearly we start off with just a plain verse. Who was manifest in the flesh? Was it just a man? No, the Bible says God was manifest in the flesh. I want you to turn with me to John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1, we're going to be looking at verse number 1. John chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Another question for you. Who or what was the Word? Word it that way. God. God. The Word was God. Look at verse number 2. The same was in the beginning with God. Look down at verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there's no, there's no question about who the Word is. We can see very clearly that it is the Lord Jesus Christ. If we begin that way, verse number 14 identifies the Word as being who? Who was who is the only begotten of the Father? Everybody knows that. That's Jesus. On every side, everybody say, well, that's Jesus, of course. If you go up to verse number one, though, the Bible plainly tells you that the Word was God. Who is the Word? God. The Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. What does 1 Timothy 3.16 teach? God was manifest in the flesh. Now, notice the perfect consistency here. God was manifest in the flesh. The Word was made flesh. And who is the Word according to John 1? God. So God was in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. We see the exact same thing being taught. Go with me to John chapter number 20. I started off with Jesus being called God in the Bible very plainly because you know what a lot of people who reject the deity of Christ, a lot of people that maybe would be a Unitarian you know, or a, uh, uh, a reformer, you know, and this is a different type of reformer as referring to like uh, Lutherans and the Reformation, uh, and uh, you know, people that would, maybe Jehovah's Witnesses that would just reject the deity of Christ and say he's just a man, he's just a divine man, and things like that, they would always say that, hey, he, you know, Jesus is not really God. And they'll try to eliminate all the verses and try to argue against all the verses that say that Jesus is God. But I want to show you how plain the Bible calls Jesus God over and over again. And of course, they'll try to say that he is a God, and I'm going to deal with that in just a minute. But look at John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20, and what they often say is, hey, he's Lord, he's a Lord, but he's not like God. This is one of their things that they'll bring up. Well, look at John chapter number 20, look at verse number 27. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. Verse number 28, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. So who did Thomas call Jesus? My Lord and my God. He called them both. So he's not only Lord, he's not just some man that God made Lord. No, he is, like Thomas said, it was Thomas's Lord and Thomas's God. He said, my Lord and my God. And then it says, just to make sure that Thomas wasn't saying something blasphemous, he's like, hey, I'm not God. I'm not Lord. You know, that's God. I'm just, you know, I'm just the under Lord. Look at verse number 29. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So notice, he's reassuring him of this. It's a, it's a good thing. And he's saying, and those that believe the same thing that you believe now, those people that are blessed. Those people that would believe without seeing this, those people that are, they would be blessed. I want you to turn with me now to, uh, let's go over to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. <clears throat> We're going to fly through some scripture tonight because it's, it's very basic, so we won't have to spend a lot of time on it, but just very plainly stated truths in the Bible. Ephesians chapter number 4, look at verse number 6. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So how many gods are there? And we know this, of course. One. There's one God. There's not a multitude of gods. There's not a multitude of gods. There's not more than one God. The Bible states over and over again. Old Testament, New Testament, there is only one God. The, the Christian religion, the Bible, the religion based upon the Bible is a monotheistic religion. It means it's one God. We worship one God. The Bible teaches that there is one God. So if, if Jesus is called God, is it possible for him to be, be, you know, this second God? It's not possible. It's very simple, right? Just, you know, you show somebody a verse that says, hey, God was manifest in the flesh. Hey, the Word was God and the Word was made flesh. And they're like, yeah, that's Jesus, but he's this other God. Well, then you take him to Ephesians 4. The Bible says there's one God. The Bible says there's only one God. There are a multitude of verses, verses that teach that there is only one God. There's only one God. Go to Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2. Throw some uh, little different curveballs in here that you can uh, show people. And 
I went over this in one other sermon. But look with me at Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now notice what it says, the glorious appearing, and then it says, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about the second coming of Christ. Now when Jesus Christ comes back, who comes with him specifically? The saints. Does anyone else as far as, you know, maybe like God the Father or some other deity, right? Does anyone else come with him? You know, because this is what Jehovah's Witnesses, right, would try to teach. Is it, is it two people? Is it two gods? Or is it just one? Right. Now, right there, what people will try to say is, they'll try to say that this is speaking of two different people. And even Jehovah's Witnesses will say, it's, and Mormons teach this as well, that it is two different gods. They would say that there is the great God, and then they would say, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But actually, this is talking about one person. And we do this commonly, and the Bible does this all the time. It's the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. The great God is our Savior. And the Bible does this, uses this uh, in language all the time. Do you know who God the Father, he's called, number one, as I just said, God the Father. But do you know what else it will say? God and the Father. You notice that? God and the Father. So it'll say just God the Father, but then it'll sometimes split up these attributes and say God and the Father. So that's all that the Bible is doing right here. And I could further prove that to you. Look at Titus chapter number, number uh, 3 and it's verse number 4. Watch this. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior. So notice who the Savior is. Who is the Savior? It's God. What does it say in Titus 2, 13 like we read before? The great God and our Savior. It's speaking of the same person. One time it just puts an and in there and just separates these attributes and then the other time it just runs them together. Look at Titus chapter number 1, verse number 3. Titus chapter number 1, verse number 3. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, watch this, according to the commandment of God our Savior. So when it says the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, it's saying that the great God is our Savior. He is the great God and He's our Savior. It's two different things. It's, you can see that very clearly taught in the book of Titus. Uh, go over to Matthew chapter number 1. Matthew chapter number 1. So He's called God. That's what we're looking at right now. In the Bible, Jesus is referred to as God. And there's a lot of material that I would have to leave out, of course, uh, that you could preach, you know, even just a sermon like this with these points, you could just continually add so many verses to this subject of where Jesus is called God and then all the other six points. Uh, Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 23, we see Jesus called God again. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6. Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6. So we see that Jesus was called Emmanuel. Why? Because he was God with us. God with us. That's Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6. Isaiah chapter number 9, get there myself, look at verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Notice what he's called. He's called Wonderful. Why is he called Wonderful? Because he is Wonderful. Not because another person's Wonderful that he's like on behalf of, because he is Wonderful. Look at what it says next. Counselor. He is the counselor. That's what he's here for, right? To be a counselor, to be a teacher. Then it says this. The mighty God. He is called the mighty God. Now, this is just uh, something that, and you, you understand this even just uh, uh, subconsciously, that the spirit of the Bible does not allow something like, like this to go on outside of the context of talking about God. There is never a time in the Bible where you ever hear a man called the mighty God. Can you imagine something like that taking place in the Bible? Do you know how blasphemous that would be outside of the context of actually speaking of and speaking to God himself? It is the mighty God. And then what else is he called? The everlasting father, the prince of peace. He's called the mighty God. Can you imagine... 
Can you imagine someone saying that to Elijah? Like calling him that. Or Moses. Like saying, behold, the mighty God. That is so blasphemous, isn't it? Because it never takes place outside. So the people that try to say that Jesus is just a man, you can never reconcile these verses. You would never be able to reconcile the fact that this man, which he is a man, you think that he's a man only, that this man is actually called the mighty God. And don't even try the argument that, hey, there's multitude of gods or he's a God. No, the Bible says there's only one God. Only one God, and Jesus is called the mighty God. He's referred to as, in the Bible, the mighty God. Rightfully so, by the Holy Spirit, by men, and he receives this. So he is the mighty God. Go to 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 20. 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 20. Read you from one other location in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 45 Isaiah chapter number 45, I'll just read this to you, you don't need to turn there. Isaiah chapter number 45, verse number 5, I am the Lord and there is none else, there is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. And then he goes on, and, and uh, you've probably heard that before, you can read that if you'd like. Um, and then at the end, he also says the same thing in verse 21, Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. And then he says this, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. I had, to, I had to omit some of the very simple points because I wanted this to be a shorter, quick sermon that's very basic. Another one of the points is the Savior. Jesus is referred to as the Savior over and over again. His name means Savior. And God is very clearly, he says over and over again, he declares that he is the only Savior. So that's another side point that maybe you could study out. But see that God says he is the only God. Specifically, God. We're looking at the word God. Look at 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 20. <clears throat> and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true. And then it says, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is, this is the true God and eternal life. Clearly referring to Jesus as God once more. The point number two is this. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is referred to, and it, the Bible teaches very plainly that Jesus is and was the creator. I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter number one. Colossians chapter number one. Now this, the, what we're looking at right now is, is in light of people that would maybe try to teach or believe that Jesus was just a man. He was just a man. We're going to look at clear verses that teach that Jesus created the world. That he created the world. Now, do you think just a man created the world? Do you think there's just some man or some angel that created the world? There's an abundance of verses that tell us from beginning to end that God created the world, aren't there? Just so many verses that say that God created the world. But now, in the context of the man Christ Jesus, and he is a man, the problem is he's, just not, he's not just a man. The man Christ Jesus, the Bible tells us, created the world. And the reason why is because, as we saw, God was manifest in the flesh. That one God that created the world became a man. Look at Colossians chapter number 1, verse number 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Then it says this, For by him were all things created. So speaking of Jesus, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. The point is every single thing. There was nothing that was not made by him. That's the point. It says all things were created by him and for him. Now, Unitarians try to take this verse and they try to make this verse to only mean that everything was created for him. But it's so ironic, it's so ridiculous that they would even try to do that because the Bible differentiates at the end of the verse. Look at the end of the verse. It says, all things were created, look at this, by him and for him. So yes, the Bible teaches that all things are created for him and he created all things for himself and you know in the book of Revelation it talks about how the he that is on the throne God and they would also admit that says that he created all things and for his own good pleasure right 
Well, right here it says that Jesus created all things for himself. And it says that all things were made for him, but then it also says that all things were made by him. Everything. Notice that. Everything was made by Jesus. You think just a normal man created the world? Not a chance. How ridiculous. When the Bible tells you, how do you reconcile the fact that the Bible says over and over again that God created the world? But then over and over again, the Bible tells you also on this hand that Jesus created the world. Let me tell you how. God was manifest in the flesh. It's that simple. It's that easy, that easy, simple statement that is meant to be just easily understood and accepted and believed. You just need to believe the Bible. Look at Hebrews chapter number 3, another very interesting one that shows that Jesus is the creator, number one, and also he's called God here. Look at Hebrews chapter number 3. Very clear, very good verse. Verse number 2 says, Who was faithful to him that appointed him. This is talking about Jesus. It says, As also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Now, who's this man? Jesus, right? So Jesus, it's saying, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. In as much. So in this way, this is why. He's going to explain to you why he's accounted worthy of more glory. As he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. So he says that's because the man that built the house has more honor than the house. Now look at verse number 4. For every house is built by some man, but then it says this, but he who built all things is God. You know what it just called Jesus? God. In turn of talking about him making all things and being greater than Moses, it's saying that Jesus created all things. Go back to John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. And then Hebrews chapter number 1 verse number 2 of course teaches this as well. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. In Hebrews chapter number 11 it tells us that he created, that God that is, created all things by the word of God. So notice this consistency over and over again. And now we'll see this again in John chapter number 1. And we read this, but I want to kind of focus on a different aspect of it. <clears throat> John chapter number 1 get there myself. My pages are a little folded here. John chapter number 1. Look at verse number 1 again. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, The same was in the beginning with God. Now I want to focus on verse 3. All things were made by Him. That's talking about the Word. That's talking about God. The Word is God. All things were made by Him. Now watch this. And without Him was not anything made that was made, right? So notice there that it says that everything was created by God. Now, this verse alone proves that Jesus is not a created being. Do you know how? Because the verse actually teaches that anything that was made was made by Jesus. So think about that for a minute. Anything that has ever been made, it says, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Saying anything that was ever made, there was never anything that was made that was not made by Jesus. So let me ask you a question. Could Jesus then be made? Of course not. It's not possible, right? Because everything that was made was made by Jesus. Why? Because in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. So it's very, very clear. Over and over and over again you can see that Jesus created the world. That Jesus is the Creator. No man, of course, created the world. God created the world. We know that God created the world. So that's another one. Real quick point, and I had to throw this in there just because it's, it's such a good point, but I, I want to fly through this one. The fact that Jesus is referred to as Lord. He's called Lord from beginning to end. And you could probably think of numerous verses. Acts chapter number 16, verse number 31 is a good one. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Romans chapter number 10 verse number 9 that if thou shalt if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. So he's called Lord. I mean you could in the in the New Testament you could come up with so many different times where he's called Lord. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. What uh, the people that deny or reject you know the deity of Christ the fact that he is God in the flesh and when I say God in the flesh the one God obviously. Jehovah God of the Old Testament. They'll say, oh, well, you know, he's a Lord. This is their only way of, you know, trying to get around this. He's a Lord, but he's not, you know, the Lord Jehovah. 
Just like they say, hey, he's a God, right? Even though the Bible never teaches this, they have to you know, make this up and extrapolate this out. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse number 47. It says, the first man is of the earth, earthy. And then notice what it says about Jesus. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So notice who it says that Jesus is. The Lord, the Lord, definite article, from heaven. If I said to you, the Lord which is in heaven, who am I speaking about? Who would the Bible be talking about? I mean, by just a plain surface reading, of course it's speaking about the Lord Jehovah. It's talking about God. Uh, another example of this, and, and you could kind of you know, uh, extend this out and just build upon it, it's like Romans chapter 10, verse 13. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, wh who is that talking about, them calling upon there? Remember, Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Then Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a quote from the Old Testament. And when that quotes the Old Testament, do you know what it's talking about? It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, and it's actually Jehovah. It's in all caps. The name of Jehovah. That's what it's saying in the Old Testament. The name of the Lord shall be saved. We see it quoted in the New Testament. It's talking about Jesus. Can you imagine? Just people, if, if you had to accept this doctrine, you've got to take it to its full extent. Can you imagine Jesus just being a normal man? Or, or, or just another man just like Moses, Elijah. One of the, and I'm trying to pick the greatest men, right? To make this somewhat reasonable or give them the best chance of those that deny the deity of Christ. Can you imagine the Bible saying about Moses or Elijah or someone like that, that whosoever calls upon their name. And quoting a verse that was talking about Jehovah and saying that they would have to call upon their name. Moses or Elijah, some other man. Just a man, not God. That would be utter blasphemy. You and I both know the Bible would never teach such a thing. It's ridiculous. It's complete blasphemy. Uh, and of course the Bible tells us there's only one Lord. There's only one Lord. There's not multiple Lords. So which one is it? Is it Jehovah's the Lord or is it Jesus is the Lord. So, number one is Jesus is called God. Number one, Jesus is the creator. Number, number three, uh, uh, number two is Jesus is the crea creator. Number three is that Jesus is called Lord. He's referred to as Lord when the Bible says there's only one Lord. Jesus, uh, God in the Old Testament says, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. He's saying there's no other Lord beside me, there's no other God beside me. Point four is the fact, just real quick, uh, uh, the Lord of Lords. Go to Deuteronomy 10.17. So this, is, this builds on that even further. And I think this is a really strong point. You can show someone. Deuteronomy. These are real simple points. Deuteronomy 10, 17. <clears throat> now how many, how many Lord of Lords can there be? Only one. There's no way to have multiple Lords of Lords. That doesn't make sense. It's, 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 and it says Lord of Lords. Singular. You can't have two guys that are both the Lord of Lords. Right? That means that everyone else is in subjection to this Lord. He's the Lord of Lords. Right? Look at Deuteronomy 10, 17, speaking about Jehovah, God Almighty from the Old, Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter number 10, verse number 17, it says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty, and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. So notice that Jehovah there, and you notice in the very beginning of verse 17, it says, For the Jehovah, right? The Lord that's saying, your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords. Go to Revelation 19, 16. Revelation chapter number 19, 16. This is, of course, Jesus. Revelation 19, 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is called Lord of lords. You know, that's a specific title, of course, that's given to Jehovah. But then also, you can't have more than one, so you have to pick. So now are you telling me that they're both, you know, lords, but Jesus now, he's the Lord of lords. He's the Lord of Jehovah. That's the only option that you would have there if you want both of them to be lords. Look at uh, John chapter number, we'll skip John 1 and 1 again. We won't go back to it. Uh, but go to John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. Another one is the fact that the Bible teaches that Jesus is eternal. So these are basic ways to prove, basic proofs that are very obvious to prove that Jesus is God. No man is eternal. No man is eternal. 
we're going to see that Jesus was eternal and is eternal. Look at John chapter number 8, verse number 58. <clears throat> Actually, we'll, we'll back up a little bit. Look at uh, verse number 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Verse 59, Then took they up stones to cast in him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. The, the Jews understood what Jesus was saying. Number one, that's a title that Jehovah uses of the Old Testament, saying, I am, I am that I am. But furthermore, he's saying that he is a way in which to teach and to declare his eternality. Go over to John 8, 24 in the same exact passage. He again makes this similar statement that in a title that uh, Jehovah uses of the Old Testament. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And look down to verse 27. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Go to Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 8. Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 8. We're looking at Jesus' eternality. The fact that Jesus is eternal. No man is just eternal. There's no eternal man. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Look at verse number 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Go to Revelation 22. Revelation chapter number 22. So this is Jesus speaking, and he's saying he's the first and the last. Again, that's a title. That's, that is a, a, a phrase title that is used from the Old Testament. And it's a phrase that Jehovah uses. And he, when he is speaking about the fact that he is eternal, and he says, I am the first and the last. Look at Revelation 22, verse number 12. This is Jesus speaking again. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. That's a quote from Isaiah 62, 11, from the Lord. Look at verse 13, Jesus speaking. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So we have a bunch of different statements where, and I didn't even go through all of them. I want to like give you some basics where Jesus in the New Testament is saying and teaching that he is eternal. Before Abraham was, he said, I am. He said, I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And, and people, they don't, they're not consistent. So I looked up some interpretations that people would try to use. He must have got the wrong time again. I, used, I looked up some interpretations that people would try to use of this passage and get this. People will try to say, well, that is, it's, it's just him in prospect. Like when, like when Jesus says, you know, uh, uh, before Abraham was, I am. That is that the prospect, this is what Unitarians will say. That's that the prospect of Jesus was there, that the plan of Jesus was foreordained, that he was slain before the foundation of the world. That doesn't mean that he actually existed, because most Unitarians that say that Jesus is not Christ, or I'm sorry, Jesus is not God, they will say that Jesus was created. Most don't say that he's an angel, right? That's, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, Mormons, and they're just kind of new. Like the other Unitarians that have existed, that exist today and have existed throughout history, all of them believe that Jesus was just like created. So how do they explain? I looked this up. How do they explain these verses where Jesus says, I am the first and the last, the beginning and the ending? You know, the Alpha and the Omega. And that's what they say. They say, well, that's Jesus just saying that I've always been ordained. I've always been in prospect. But here's the problem with that. What did it mean in the book of Isaiah when God said, I am the first and the last? What did he mean there? Get the context. What did it mean when he's explaining that there's... He says, I am the first and the last, and then he goes on to explain, and there is no God before me. What is he explaining there? What did it mean when God said it in the Old Testament? What did that mean? Well, of course it meant that he was eternal. So you see this vast inconsistency here where, you know, it very clearly in the Old Testament, everybody would read it and understand, yeah, when Jehovah said, I am the first and the last, he's saying that he's eternal. But then all of a sudden when Jesus uses the same statement, 
Well, it's just saying that Jesus is just kind of set up from everlasting. You know, he's the first and the last in that sense. That's ridiculous. That's, that's totally inconsistent. If somebody, if you showed somebody both of those passages and they walked away and still tried to say, oh, well, he means something totally different than he means here, that's a dishonest person is what that is. Jesus Christ said, I am the first and the last. Number one, because he's identi identifying himself as Jehovah because that's a statement that exclusively Jehovah has used. The God of the Old Testament, number one. But number two, he's just teaching that, hey, I'm eternal. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Just like uh, God said of the Old Testament repeatedly, he taught that he was eternal. Uh, I want you to go with me to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. Uh, the next point is that Jesus is omnipresent. Show me another man. This is a challenge to anyone who says that Jesus was not God. Show me another man that's omnipresent. How stupid and how ridiculous can you possibly be? Yeah, show me, was Elijah omnipresent? Was he able to be in multiple places at one time? Was Mo Moses omnipresent? Could he be in multiple places at one time? These are the greatest men of God that ever lived. And people say, oh, Jesus, you know, he's not God. He's just a normal man, just like any other man. Yeah, he had some divine characteristics, but he's just a man, right? Tell me why Jesus is omnipresent. And what man is omnipresent and able to be in multiple places at multiple times? How ridiculous. Look at John chapter number 3. Look at verse number 12. He says, If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? How would he be able to tell of heavenly things? Maybe because he's from heaven? Like it says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, it says that he is the Lord from heaven. Look at verse 13 now. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now that is a mouthful. There is so much to learn from there. Notice he says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but only he that came down from heaven. So where did Jesus come from? Came from heaven, didn't he? The Lord from heaven. He said, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Now let me ask you this question too. Has Jesus already... Like when he was speaking, this is Nicodemus, while he was talking to Nicodemus, had Jesus actually ascended up to heaven yet? In an earthly sense, in, in time sense, or the timeline of just human history? Not yet, had he. Do you know how Jesus had already ascended up to heaven and how that is still true? It's because he's God and he's outside of time. He is omnipresent and he is, of course, it comes along with that, he is eternal. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He'd already ascended in the sense that God does not experience time from beginning to Like it says in the Old Testament, you know, the Lord or God says, He says, I am He that inhabiteth eternity. So that's how He had already ascended up to heaven because He is eternal. And he says, but He that came down from heaven, and notice what it says, even further to confuse you even more. It says, even the Son of Man, which is, present tense, is in heaven. He's sitting there and standing there and talking to Nicodemus. And you know what he tells Nicodemus? I'm in heaven right now. And I came down from heaven and I've already ascended into heaven. How confusing does that sound? What other man is omnipresent? I mean, there's no other way to interpret it. He's playing what he's saying. It's very clear. And why is he saying, hey, I can tell you of heavenly things? What's the point that he's trying to get across to him? Saying that he came down from heaven was his point. And he says, and no man hath ascended up to heaven. You know what he's trying to teach him? I'm omnipresent and I'm eternal, Nicodemus. You know what he's trying to tell him? It's real obvious. I'm God, Nicodemus. I'm not just a normal man, Nicodemus. I'm God. I want you to look with me now. Let's go to uh, Luke chapter number 23. We'll see where the Bible teaches again that Jesus is omnipresent. Omnipresent. These are clear passages. Clear passages that plainly state. Now, when Jesus died, how many days was he dead for? How many days? Three days. Jesus was dead for three days and three nights. The Bible is real clear. When Jesus raises from the dead, Mary approaches him. And what does Jesus say to Mary? Exactly. He says, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended unto my Father. So during those, that three-day period, had Jesus been to heaven yet? He hadn't. He said, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended unto my Father. Right? He still had that body that he had died in without it being glorified yet. Right? So he said, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. He was dead for three days and three nights. Now, where is paradise, according to the Bible, very clearly? It's in heaven. 
Paradise is in heaven. Revelation tells you that. You know, uh, 2 Corinthians tells you that. So he's saying he hadn't yet ascended to paradise. He hadn't yet been uh, in heaven. He hadn't been to his father. Look at Luke chapter number 23 when Jesus is speaking to the thief on the cross, showing that Jesus is omnipresent and that he is eternal. Luke 23, 42. And he said unto Jesus, this is the thief, Lord, notice he calls him Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto, unto thee, look at this, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. According to Jesus, everybody believes that Jesus' words are true, right? Everything Jesus says is true, right? So, According to Jesus, when was the thief on the cross? What day was the thief on the cross in paradise with Jesus? That day. But let me ask you a question. What do we, what do we know about Jesus? You know, in a, in a worldly sense, his body and everything on this earth, the man Christ Jesus. We also know very plainly and very clearly that what? He was dead for how long? Three days and three nights. And after he had rose from the dead and Mary came to him, what did he say? Touch me not, for I have not yet what? Ascended to my father. Not yet went to my father. Right? How does it make sense? What did, what did Jesus tell Nicodemus? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. And then he said this, But the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Why would the Son of Man be in heaven? Present tense. Why? Because God was manifest in the flesh. Because Jesus Christ was God, and he is the eternal spirit of God. And while he was in heaven... He was also simultaneously, because he is omnipresent, he was on this earth living as a man. That's why the Bible tells us great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of godliness. God is not restrained to the same, you know, men are restrained to that. This is proving that he's not just a normal man. That he could tell the thief on the cross, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Because you know what happened? That thief took his last breath, he died, and do you know where he went? He went to heaven. And do you know who's in heaven? God is in heaven. You know what he saw? He saw the throne of God. And you know who was seated on that throne? Jesus. That was who was seated on that throne. He saw Jesus on the throne. While Jesus also was dead for three days and three nights. So the, the, it, that is the mystery of godliness. That is the aspect of God that is just, it's uh, uh, majestic and it's amazing. It shows the power of God. The eternality and the omnipresence of Jesus Christ proved that he was not just a man, but rather that he was God. Another thing is... Uh, that Jesus is referred to as being the Spirit of God. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter number 14. This kind of gets into the overlap and the Trinity and, you know, uh, all three of them being one. Look at John chapter number 14. I want you to look with me at verse number 14. He says, If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Look at verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth. So who is the comforter? It's the Spirit of truth. It's the Holy Spirit, isn't it? The Holy Spirit is what God sends, and it comes and lives in our hearts, right? Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Watch what it says further. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. Notice that statement. And shall be in you. So he's saying he dwells with you and shall be in you. Now look what it says next. Verse 18. I, this is Jesus speaking, will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So notice how, and notice that's the eternality and that is the omnipresence of God. Of course, Jesus is going to ascend up to heaven but he's going to send the Holy Spirit. But at the same exact time, because Jesus is God, and these three are one, uh, Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of God. And he tells them, hey, we're going to send a comfort. And he says, I will not leave you comfortless. He says, I will come to you. So who's going to be coming to them? The Spirit of God, right? The Holy Ghost. But it's also true to say who? Jesus is going to be coming to them. Could you say that about any man? Can you imagine saying like the, the spirit of Moses or the spirit of Elijah lives inside of you or you know some other man, just a random man, just a man, not God, lives inside of you and dwells inside of you. 
That is ridiculous sounding. That just shows that people, this idea of trying to teach this garbage doctrine that Jesus is not God, that people don't think this all the way through. When Jesus clearly says that he is going to come and dwell in our hearts. Now that makes perfect sense when it, we know that Jesus was God in the flesh. He was the Spirit of God in human flesh. And when he goes to heaven, you know what he does? He sends his Spirit. And that's how he says, I'm going to dwell inside of you. And that's how he is omnipresent because it is the Spirit of God. Further to prove that, look at verse 19. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. Proving that he was talking about himself clearly. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, watch this, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. I want you to turn with me now to uh, Colossians, real quickly, Colossians chapter number one. Other verses that clearly teach that Jesus dwells inside of us. Jesus is living inside of us. Of course, we know that that is the Holy Spirit. And who is the Holy Spirit? God. We know that very clearly. These people that would reject the deity of Christ, they would say, hey, yeah, you know, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, yeah, it's God. You know, that's God. That's just God's Spirit, right? And I agree with them. It's just God's Spirit. And they would just say, that's all that there is. You know, they would say, it's just God the Father and His Spirit and Jesus is not God. He's just a normal man. But then why in the world does the Bible teach that we know and we agree that, hey, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, but it also teaches that Christ dwells inside of you, that Christ lives inside of you. How would that make sense if he's just a man? Look at uh, Colossians, Colossians chapter number 1, verse number 27. Colossians chapter number 1, verse number 27, the Bible says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, watch this, which is Christ in you the hope of glory. Look at Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Sorry, wrong verse. Go to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Another clear teaching. This will be the last passage that we turn to. That the Spirit of God dwelling in us is actually Christ dwelling in us. Look at Romans chapter number 8, look at verse number 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ. Now what did it just say before that? It said the Spirit of God, didn't it? Now it's saying, but if any man have not the Spirit of Christ. Right? So notice it's God's Spirit, it's the Spirit of Christ. Now let me ask you this question too, but I, before I read further... You know, like the spirit of Tyler, would you say that's a, that's a different person or would you just say that that's me? My spirit is, is, is just like a totally different person than me or it's me? You say it's me, right? The spirit of Tyler's me, right? So the spirit of God is who? It's God. Right? You know, it's not a totally different person. It's not this other being or something. The spirit of God is God. It's just his spirit, right? Right? So when it says the spirit of God, who's it talking about? God. But then it interchangeably says... If any man have not the Spirit of Christ. So who is that now talking about? Christ. So notice that the Spirit of God is equivalent or the same as the Spirit of Christ. It's one and the same. Showing there, we can already see this overlap between Christ being God, God being Christ. And to further prove that, look at verse 10, what it says now. And if, look at this, Christ be in you. Just like I said, the Spirit of Christ is who? It's Christ. So if the Spirit of Christ is dwelling in you, who is going to be dwelling in you? Christ. If Christ is God, of course we can refer to it also as, you know, the Spirit of God. Now Christ is, of course, Christ means Messiah. Christ is specifically, you know, the seed or the promised seed that would come one day from mankind. The promise is given unto Adam. And what ended up happening was... God came and God was born in the flesh. He was born of the seed of man. He was born of that seed and he was that Messiah in the flesh. And that's who we refer to when we say Christ, we're referring to God specifically in the flesh. 
Not just God as a spirit in heaven, dwelling in heaven. Christ is God when he was living as a man or when he was in the flesh. So notice it says in verse 10, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Notice that the Holy Spirit dwelling in us would be Christ in us. Look at verse 11. But if, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Are we talking about like six spirits dwelling in us? Of course not. It's one spirit. And now that notice that the spirit of Christ, who is Christ dwelling in you, is referred to as what? The spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. Who is, who is him that raised Jesus from the dead? It's God. God raised Jesus from the dead. And it's just referring to interchangeably Christ's spirit, the spirit of Christ. Can you imagine? Can you imagine in the Bible? This is, these are just basic, quick, basic truths. You know, uh, 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 any man being referred to like this. The spirit of Elijah, the spirit of God, interchangeably. And if Elijah be in you, you know, then your, your spirit, your, life, your flesh is dead, but your spirit is alive. Can you imagine how ridiculous and how stupid that sounds? These are just basic truths that teach. Just, and I wanted this to be very elementary, very basic. Number one, Jesus is called God. God was manifest in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. You know, he's called Emmanuel because God is with us. In Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6, he's called the mighty God. These are all things Jesus is called. Uh, we see that Jesus is the creator. He's referred to as the creator multiple times. No man is the creator. No man is called God. Jesus is the creator of all things. Jesus is called Lord. He's referred to as Lord all throughout the New Testament. Furthermore, he's called the Lord of Lords. That's a title just given to Jehovah. Jesus is called Lord of Lords. Jesus is eternal. You can see that Jesus is eternal. No man is eternal. These are basic truths to prove that Jesus is God. Jesus is omnipresent. While he was on this earth, he says that he was in heaven. Jesus is omnipresent. No man is omnipresent. Jesus is the Spirit of God. Why? Because he is God. It's just as simple as that. The Bible tells you God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why is Jesus Christ equated with the Spirit of God? We started off with the basic verse. And if you just want to prove to somebody, just to shut the argument down real quick, that Jesus is God, turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. God was manifest in the flesh. The Bible's very clear. Jesus is God. And let me say this at the very end. People can maybe get a little bit confused. People can be deceived by others, you know, to, to a degree, you know, that Jesus is not God or things like that. They can just kind of get confused about this. But let me tell you this, that if a person, at the moment that they, that they pray and they ask Jesus to save them, they must be calling upon the name of the Lord. They must know that Jesus is God. They must be praying to the Lord to save them. No man can save you. You must be trusting in God. So when you're trusting in Jesus, you must believe that Jesus is God. You cannot be trusting in a, in a Jesus that is, that is not God or a Jesus that is not man. I'm sorry, that is just a man. You cannot be trusting in a Jesus that is not God and that is just a man. You cannot be. You cannot do that because you know why? Then you're not trusting in God. And you must be trusting in God to save you. God is the only Savior. So, like the Bible says, you know, uh, Jesus very plainly states that if you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. So it's very important where our soul winning emphasize the fact that Jesus is God. Show them. Use these verses if you need to. Very plain, clear verses that just teach that Jesus is God. A lot of principles and thoughts that just teach that Jesus is God. There's no way around it. True, strong evidences. Let's bow our heads and have a uh, word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that, uh, that, that you are our Savior, that you came down, were born on the earth for us, and, and that you, you know, uh, became a man, became flesh. You love us so much that you didn't you know, uh, send some other person, you didn't create some man, but you did it for us, just expressing your love so much more. We're so thankful that, for that, dear Lord. We ask you that you would uh, uh, help us to, uh, uh, no matter how well and, and we understand and know this doctrine, that we would grow in it and that we would be able to teach others and that we would understand the importance of, uh, of understanding the deity of Christ. And we thank you so much for it, dear Lord, and just uh, be with our church, be with everyone that is here, and uh, bless all of the prayer requests, dear God. And uh, we love you so much again, and in Jesus Christ's name, amen.